You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Well, good morning, everyone. On behalf of all my colleagues on the staff and the board and all the members of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest in our future forum events, this one on the future of manufacturing. Uh, for any of you who don't know me, I'm Bill Allen. I'm CEO of the LADC, but I have a great team who really deserves recognition for putting together such a great panel of speakers. Rick Mullis, who's head of our events in the back of the room, Elsa Flores, our Vice President of Strategic Relations, Mark Nicholson, Lizette Tejada, their team has done a wonderful job bringing all of you here, and I'm glad to see we have such a full house for this important conversation. We have a wonderful lineup of presenters for you this morning, and we're hoping that you'll all engage with us in conversation with these folks. We're going to have some Q&A session opportunities, and we also have online opportunities. We hope that you'll participate online as well using the hashtag LAEDC Future Forum or any of the other handles that you see here on the screen. You may have noticed we did not print formal program booklets for you this morning. That's in our effort to uh, sustain our environment. But there are digital uh, programs available to you. There's a URL, which is right here and on the back of your badges and maybe in the confirmation email that was sent to you if you want to access the digital program with more information about our impressive lineup of speakers this morning. Uh, I always like to remind you that the LADC's purpose is to collectively advance opportunity and prosperity for all of the residents of the greater LA region. And I emphasize collectively today because it's one of the reasons we do these programs and invite all of you. We need you all as active, engaged partners and stewards if we're going to help ensure that everyone who lives in this county has an opportunity to access the abundant prosperity that is available through this nation size LA County economy. We implement this mission by focusing on seven key goals of a thriving economy, goals that were developed for and with us by leaders in the business community, the labor community, the government community, the education community, environmental community, nonprofits, philanthropy, faith-based organizations. It was a broad cross-section of hundreds and hundreds of stakeholder organizations throughout the county who created the LA County Strategic Plan for Economic Development. There's a role for every one of you to play in helping advance these goals, and we hope you'll get actively engaged in our work, join the LADC, participate with us as we pursue this noble mission, because if we do it well together, we can truly create an even stronger, more vibrant, more diverse, more sustainable, and more inclusive economy for this region for generations to come. To that end, our LADC Institute for Applied Economics conducts research on the key industries that offer well-paying jobs for our residents here in the region. This research also helps inform our programs and initiatives and many of the programs and initiatives by our partners in these different sectors that I mentioned. It helps us focus our efforts on growing well-paying jobs and key industries and export activity and wealth generation for this region. Today's forum topic, the future of manufacturing, is one that our uh, institute has done a lot of work on. It's critically important and is relevant to many of our targeted industry sectors we have focused on because they provide well-paying jobs and wealth-generating effects for this region. It's critical to all of us who are trying to grow our economy, foster innovation, create pathways to prosperity for more of our region's residents. Manufacturing has long helped both advanced and emerging economies drive economic growth and raise living standards for their residents. That's certainly been true here in Los Angeles County, a county which employs more people in manufacturing than any county in America. It has historically helped us lift hundreds of thousands of LA County residents into middle class lifestyles and existences and wages through the well paying jobs associated with the manufacturing industry sectors operating throughout our region. However, manufacturing is undergoing significant change at an ever increasing rate as the global mega forces of technology innovation, globalization, climate change, and even changing consumer expectations are all increasingly impacting what we make, how we make it, and what skills are needed by the companies who do make things. The changes we'll discuss today create both challenges and opportunities for our manufacturers, our labor force, our innovation ecosystems, our educational institutions, and our policymakers. Our presenters this morning will be discussing how emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, industrial IoT, augmented reality, and the digital transformation of our workforce are reshaping 
the manufacturing industries here in LA County. Our panel of experts will be discussing the value proposition of moving towards smart manufacturing, how digital transformation can benefit both your businesses and your workers, how to make the newest technologies more accessible for manufacturers, how higher education partners in LA County can provide the proper talent to our manufacturers operating here in the Southern California region. To put these kinds of programs on requires financial resources and intellectual capital, and we get both from our major sponsors. First, I'd like to acknowledge our presenting sponsor, California State University Dominguez Hills, for their foresight in helping us conceive and develop these programs three years ago, and for having been the presenting sponsor of the entire series for the past three years. I also want to thank and acknowledge our partner and featured keynote speaker this morning, PricewaterhouseCoopers, for their commitment to helping us better understand the forces at play and how they're likely to impact the future of our industries. They provide this series with unparalleled expertise and intellectual capital. I'd like you to hear a few words from our partner in this effort for the last three years, California State University Dominguez Hills and their distinguished provost, Michael Spagna. I just want you to understand how important California State University Dominguez Hills is here to our region. It is a truly diverse, truly welcoming and inclusive community of learners and educators collaborating to change lives and our communities for the better. With strong academic programs, dedicated faculty mentors, supportive staff, and many campus amenities, California State University Dominguez Hills is committed to connecting students to a high quality and transformative education while providing our communities and our industries with a vital resource for diverse talent, knowledge, skills, and leadership needed to thrive today and tomorrow. We are honored to have the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Cal State Dominguez Hills with us this morning, and he's going to share a little bit more about what they're doing at the university to foster growth and workforce development for their students. Please welcome Provost Dr. Michael Spagnon. So another round of applause for Bill. He's back from sabbatical and looks well rested and an exceptional partner and leader. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for partnering with us. So on behalf of Thomas Parham and our deans and faculty and staff, our vice president, Carrie Stewart, if they could just share, wave their hands. We have a lot of Toros in the house. And I would share with you if we could have a round of applause for all of them. Then I'm going to give the audience the secret. So when you come and visit us on campus and see the amazing things we're doing on campus, I'm going to give you the secret hall pass, all right? So this is how you say once a Toro, always a Toro, like this, OK? Now notice it in three dimensions, because if you do this or do this, you'll get smiles, but you're not going to get the reaction you'll get if you say <laughs> once a Toro, always a Toro. Um, on behalf of President Parham, uh, we are so excited to uh, co-sponsor this event. Uh, and I will tell you that the real sensitivity we have at Dominguez Hills is really developing the workforce for tomorrow. And so our programs, you know, I, I will note a couple of those very quickly. These are the programs that have students that are coming in that really are looking for jobs, that want to stay in the area, want to support our community. They range from global ling ling uh, logistics and supply chain management, uh, information systems and operations management and computer science programs, each of these programs prepare people on a career path to go into industry, to be innovators in that industry. However, often what's overlooked, and the keynote speaker and I had a conversation before we started today, what's often overlooked is the arts and humanities students. It very well could be that that next theater graduate is the one that's going to make the biggest breakthrough in information systems. So being conscious of that, and I say that because a lot of arts and humanities graduates, those numbers are dropping nationwide, and I think it's fairly myopic as a society society, they were kind of saying, well, are those career paths? Well, absolutely they're career paths. Because if you don't have that arts and humanities background, you're not going to be the person that's going to have the vista to change industries. The other thing that we really privilege at Dominguez Hills is our partnerships, whether it's internships or externships. Many of you in this room, uh, on your way out after our speakers, when you see Carrie Stewart, give her your card, because we're always looking for opportunities for our students. There's no knowledge like real world knowledge, and the only way our students can get that day one is to be in your businesses, working with you. I will tell you, we do lose students in the pipeline because they take so long to get to somebody in an industry that they'd love to go into. So getting early into that experience, we have 3,000 additional headcount coming into the university this year. It's our largest population of all time. We need those students to have those real-world experiences, and we count on you as partners to help us. 
We also have an innovation incubator on campus. We're very proud of that. In a recent WASC review that we had on the campus, we received the gold standard, 10 years reaccreditation. And one of the proudest lines in that report was the campus has an entrepreneurial spirit. We want to carry that forward. We would even argue that student success requires entrepreneurship and innovation as a key component in their general education curriculum. Every student should have that in terms of being a graduate in today's society. And then finally, I want to say to you, it's always an honor for me to be with one of our faculty. The strength of any university is its faculty. Finn Prager, raise your hand. It's always an honor to be in the room with him. He's going to be one of your speakers today, and it's wonderful having him with the group. I'm looking forward to situating myself as a learner. Welcome and congratulations to an ongoing partnership to change this community. Thank you, Michael, for those great remarks and for everything you're doing leading this wonderful university and for being such a great partner in providing these forums. I'd now like to introduce the woman who really established these forums three years ago and who leads all of our interactions with our members in the broader community as Vice President of Strategic Relations. She's going to get the formal program underway, introduce our great speakers and presenters to you. Please welcome my colleague, Elsa Flores. Thank you so much, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Another reminder, on the back side of your uh, badge has the program for you to read all of our speakers. Very impressive bios, so please log on. I'm delighted to introduce this morning our keynote speaker. He believes that what we call emerging technology all started with somebody's small business problem. Here to talk with us about how these emerging technologies are being utilized in manufacturing, please welcome our keynote presenter, PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Experience Leader, Mr. Rick Reppy. We, we on? We live? We're live. Cool. Um, and it occurs to me that I didn't test the clicker. Okay, it works. Um, so, uh, before I jump into this, I just wanted to reinforce something that Michael said. So, uh, I have a graduate degree in economics with an emphasis in mathematical and spatial modeling. I have used that exactly 4.5 times since I graduated with that degree. <laughs> I would not have the job I have if I did not have that degree. It would be, I, I never would have been in the consideration set, which is tragic on some level. I have an undergraduate degree in theater that I use multiple times every day of my life. Because what do we do in business? We convince people that they need to do things. We think critically, compassionately, and empathetically about things. And where you learn to do that is in the humanities. I currently recruit people out of MBA programs. And then I go find undergraduates with degrees in humanities and hire them and give them a couple of business classes. Because that skill set is more important to me in this element of the world called design then the MBA program is the way MBAs are currently taught. It's not an inherent problem with MBAs, except my degree's not an MBA, so I'm a snob about it. Uh, so that was my commercial for the humanities. Thank you. We will now go back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, so this whole, I don't even know where I'm pointing this thing. Uh, so this whole smart thing, oh no, that's the scary slide that comes later. The whole smart thing. Right? I mean, right now we're drowning in buzz terms. Smart manufacturing. Industrial internet of things. In IIoT. Uh, one of our panelists, who you will meet soon, uh, and I were talking. It's like, if we could just call it industrial design internet of things, the acronym would spell idiot. It would be awesome. <laughs> Industry 4.0. I missed 3.0. I didn't even know that it was a thing. I didn't know it happened because we're retroactively rebranding previous ages. So what is it? Before we get into what is smart, right? Smart is useful only to the degree that it serves people because if it serves people, it will serve business. I will make that connection for you. But first, I'm going to tell you about my mom. My mother is 83 years old. When she was 81, I bought her an iPhone X, the kind that doesn't have the little button on it. Two weeks later, I had to buy her another phone. She could not turn that damn thing on to save her life. She just couldn't figure it out. She needed the experience of a button. So your conclusion based on that piece of data is my mother is technolog technologically functionally illiterate 
And you are 50% right, but here's where you're 50% wrong. My mother is a social media maven. She lives on it. She expresses herself via her YouTube channel. <laughs> Why? Why? Why does she do that? Two reasons. One, conceptually, she understood technology better than I ever did. When I bought her a Blu-ray player sometime in the mid-2000s, because she likes really good audio and she likes to watch movies, she watched it whenever my younger brother, who lives in the same town as her, could come over and put the disc in and turn it on for her. <laughs> and she did like it. But she would shake her head at it and go, someday I'm just going to be able to make the movie show up on my TV, anticipating streaming video well before it was a thing that we talked about in any domain outside of science fiction. She knew that that would happen. And the reason she was, had faith that that would happen is because there's money in it. Because people like her would pay for it. She didn't need to know how it worked. Once it became a thing, I started explaining streaming to her, and you know, she's my mom, she loves me, she's trying to hang in. <laughs> she just glazed, and she's like, so I can watch the movie now, will you stop? <laughs> like, can you stop till I just let me watch the damn movie? Of course, I'll let you watch the damn movie. So my mother is where I, I formed my theory of user experience. People want to do some stuff so they can buy a thing, and then they want to do some things with the stuff they bought. That is the sum total of complexity. Any human being in the digital domain, your employees, your partners, your vendors, your customers, is willing to accept. They don't care how hard what you do is. Smart technology allows you to, ha to let them access stuff and things with a convenience, with a seamlessness, and with a speed heretofore unseen. And when you do that, there is money. Let's agree right now that flying a plane is hard. Right? Did anyone fly in here? Has anyone flown in the last two weeks? OK. So you just spent like two hours looking down at the tops of clouds like you were your own Greek myth. You complained about the bag of six half peanut shells that they gave you halfway through the flight, just wondering if you could get more, and wondered how much trouble you got in if you scared the bejesus out of the six-year-old behind you kicking the hell out of the back of your seat. That's what you thought about. Now, anyone in this room, in the next 30 seconds, if you felt so moved, could get the safety record of every carrier that serves the United States. You could know exactly how they're doing. Has anyone ever done that? And yet, while we complain about the half bag of peanuts and the six-year-old behind us, isn't one of our primary expectations that we arrive not dead? Isn't that like one of the things we want out of the flight? And yet, it factors into none of our purchase decisions. Why? Because we've moved beyond that. Now, just try to picture, right, if the pilot exposed to you the complexity of what he did. You land. And in that like weird gray zone before they wheel out the jet bridge and you're finally set free, some dude comes busting out of the cockpit going, Yahtzee! Nailed the landing! Runs down, giving high fives to everyone on one side of the aisle and up the other side, giving high fives to everybody else, going, do you know, crosswinds? That was a mother! I nailed it! And the first <laughs> thought in your head would be up the dosage of whatever you're taking because you are unwell. But it's extraordinarily complex. In manufacturing, what we do is extraordinarily complex. And sometimes, we try to tell that to our customers. And they do not and will not ever care. Smart allows us to mask the complexity, to make the complex, the Herculean, really simple. That's the beauty of it. And a lot of these kinds of conferences, when people talk about like future, it's people like me. It's consultants. And it's always very fire and brimstone. If you don't change now, you're out of business in three years. Wow. You know an awful lot about my financials without knowing who I am. How did that come about? And I finally figured out the reason that exists is because we're all trying to sell you something. So today, I'm not going to try to sell you nothing. The future is exciting. It's not depressing. It's not intimidating. The things you can do that you've not been able to do before are extraordinary. So I'm obligated to give you the scary slide. 70% right? of businesses will attempt to transform digitally in the next 10 years. Only 30% will succeed. That comes from the CEO of Cisco. Right? And I think they're right. And the reason I think he's right 
is simply because we tend to do technology for the sake of technology and not technology to actually solve a problem, a business problem, a business need. That's when we see people unlock the value of technology effectively. When they just do it, because like everyone has AI, I'm working with a bank right now. Their primary, one of, the, one of the Bobs, big old banks, right, really huge bank, their primary application right now of artificial intelligence, sentience where it has never existed before, is an app that will let call center reps know when someone calling in is getting unhappy. That is the logical equivalent of when TV first became a thing. The most common use of it outside of the news was to stage radio broadcasts on television. What a waste of an art form. Right, so quick free consulting when it comes to contact centers, call centers. Evacuate the building. <laughs> and I mean sweep it. Put some sensors in. Make sure it's empty that no living thing lurks anywhere in the hallways or in the pipes, anywhere. Blow it up. And find a way to serve your customers that they actually like. Because I don't need an app to let me know when someone is unhappy at a call center. They became unhappy five minutes before they called when they came to the crushing realization that their relatively simple problem can only be solved by picking up the phone and dialing it. And that's for an old, broken person like me. For my 27-year-old millennial stepdaughter, she thinks you're a dinosaur. She'll never complain. She'll never say a word to you. She will simply find another company to do business with. So, how do we get to this beautiful future that customers want, connected products and services. That's what we as customers crave. We think of the portfolio, of the need that we have. The way you get there, a necessary condition, is the smart factory. You have to get smart. And it's because we're at this really exciting, not scary, this really exciting confluence of Internet of Things, Big Data, AI, Blockchain, Additive Manufacturing and Smart Materials, Augmented Reality, Virtual Reality. Quick show of hands, this is not encoded in the DNA. It's cool if you give the negative answer. How many people here are unclear on the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? I'm not raising my hand as an example. I am unclear on the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. It's a critical difference. It's a valuable difference, and fortunately, one of the panelists you're going to hear from can tell you a lot about that. Um, the, the robots, drones, drones. Has anyone here ever played with a drone? Is it addictive or what? Like, I love those things. And there's cool business uses for drones. My mother, my 83-year-old mother, just had her first products delivered maybe three weeks ago by drone. My mom is cooler than me. I've never done that. Uh, and blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. The expectations of the customers, of the users, of the vendors, and the partners has fundamentally changed. So we have to figure out how we get started, not how we finish. How do we start? So this is the usual life cycle we see our clients go through. Starts out with awareness. Like, I get that smart technology is a thing, but I don't really know what to do. And then they get the really bad part of the cycle, which is they go learn about smart technology. They go learn about going digital, and we hit what we call the panic iteration. The panic iteration is I've now learned something about it, and like, ah! I have an overly target-rich environment. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to handle it. I've got a finite amount of money. I've got an overly target-rich environment. I'm freaking out. It's OK. You can get through that. You get through that by experimenting and adopting. Play with it. There's a lot of vendors, there are a lot of consultants, there are a lot of people out there that know more about it than you do right now, you'll learn, that can help you find safe, um, relatively well risk managed domains to start out in, especially in the manufacturing domain. Small, medium, or big doesn't matter the size. There are now things that are accessible that are free around initial use that you can use as sort of your gateway into figuring out how to step up farther. Where we see a lot of folks struggling is when they get to the integrate stage. 
right? Integrate, so it's like I've played with it, I've piloted, I've seen the value of some things, but now I'm actually gonna have to start changing the way I work. And that tends to be where sort of the, the weak of heart, the faint of heart, um, put the brakes on themselves. And it's a hard step, but it's not an impossible to solve step. Um, with where they tend to break is when do I make the change between working through a vendor and outsourcing and bringing something in-house? And there's a few ways to think about that that can be useful to you, and some of our panelists are gonna be able to talk about that. And what do I do with my people? 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 Because there's been a myth for the last five years or so that as we move towards smart anything, smart manufacturing, smart home, smart bank, smart hospital, doesn't matter. Your people aren't ready, you gotta get rid of them, you gotta get new people. It's not true. Right now, in the manufacturing space, if I ask you what the greatest asset of your company is, if you give me an answer other than your people, you're wrong. But it doesn't mean that your people have the skills and experience yet to be able to help guide you into the digital future. But I am willing to assert that the cost of upskilling them is radically lower than the cost of replacing them. And the value of keeping them and upskilling them keeps the institutional knowledge, the industry knowledge, the domain knowledge, all of the knowledge that you need that the technology algorithm hasn't yet been taught to understand, if it ever can be taught to understand it. You can do that, and it is hard, but it's easier than the alternative. The alternative is to replace your workforce. That's harder. That's more expensive, and it's got far greater risk, higher risk profile associated with it. Then we get to transform. Now, most of my clients will say, we are transforming digitally. They're not. They're not because transforming digitally goes to every aspect of what you do, right? If you have an operating model that was meant to serve a highly analog process, that operating model cannot be accidentally right for a digital age. It can't be. Now, you can transition in an abrupt way. You can transition in an orderly way. But you will need to transition. In manufacturing, there are very few companies that have an operating model that was invented before this became ubiquitous. Fundamentally changing the way we work, the way we access information, the way we seek out knowledge. Your operating model can't be right if it isn't taking this into account. Doesn't mean it's wholly wrong, it just means it's time to start looking at it. And the sooner you start looking at it, the more deliberately, the more orderly, the less chaotic the transition needs to be. If you continue to wait, if you wait another five years, another seven years, you will find yourself being buffeted by competitors that didn't have that install base. They weren't shackled by it, and so they were able to come up with a model that's better. Forget models. Sometimes people struggle with this concept. I'm working with an asset and wealth management company. They told me we're not being relevant anymore to, uh, as there's an intergenerational transfer of wealth. We just, the younger folks that are, you know, phenomenally rich, they just, they don't want to use us. They go to retail banks, they go to Mint, they go to other digital startups. And so we think the problem is that we, um, our reports need to be updated. We need to design better reports. So I said, well, let me see a report. I said, well, I brought an executive summary report with me. It was 57 pages long. <laughs> so we've tortured the definition of summary, maybe a little bit. <laughs> And, and I kind of looked at it, and I was like, well, I can fix your report without charging you. So at random, remove two-thirds of the stuff in it. Just take it out. I don't care what it is. Just take it out. Just like have people throw darts, do a lottery. Like, I don't care. Just take two-thirds out. That's one. Two, stop color coding it entirely in primary colors. It looks like a children's TV show. And that's just not really going to resonate with folks. But you're not any more relevant. Because you did that, you're just less annoying. That's not really the target, right? Does anyone have a, in their business goal for the year, be less annoying? Is that, well done, sir. Most companies would benefit by doing that. Uh, we had a client we were working with who was digitally transforming, it was an airline, and I was like, yeah, before you digitally transform, could you just have your gate agent stop screaming at me at the gate? Uh, and they thought, yeah, okay, that's probably a good idea. Um, so, again, in a world where this 
is now in everyone's hands, not everyone's hands, in many, many hands. And Wi-Fi on some level is ubiquitous. If we needed to come up with a way to communicate dense, complex information, we would not dream up the thing that we currently call a report. It would not be the answer. So this is where this thing called design thinking comes in. And you need that humanities background, you need that artistic background just to help challenge the thinking that we as business people or as engineers can be built guilty of, which is there is a truth, there is one truth. There isn't, there's many truths. It just depends on who you're developing the truth for and what the context of the story is. And if you change the parameters of the context, the truth can in fact change. So instead of asking, how do I make a better report, which is what I as a business person would do, a designer or someone who's adept at design thinking would say, how do I make information relevant, resonant, and immediately actionable? And the answer will not be a report. That will be like maybe 10th or 11th on the list. Right now, if you manufacture chairs. So, anybody here think these are the best chairs I ever sat on? Not just in the chairs, I have yet to sit on the best chair I've ever sat on, I hope, right? So, you're a chair company and you're hemorrhaging market share. People are just not buying your chairs anymore. Your product folks, most of whom will either be business people or engineers, will go, we gotta design a better chair. And what they will do is a six month research and design effort that will result in adding approximately one one hundredth of a millimeter of additional padding onto the bottom of the chair, which will keep your butt from going numb for another 37 seconds. It will not change what you think of their chair. As a customer, stuff and things. You don't want complexity, you're not giving them credit for that extra 37 seconds of comfort. If you ask a designer what to do, the designer would say, would ask the following question back to you. How can I suspend a person comfortably and productively? And the answer might be chair. It'd be a very different chair, but it might be chair. It might be a wobble stool. It might be a ball. It might, like, if someone comes up with a hammock that's got the hard table attached to it so I can do this, my office will be empty of chairs in, like, 24 hours. We will go to the hammock system, and, yeah, my employees will take a lot of naps. I won't know because I'll be napping too. But I am pretty sure they will stay in the office longer. They will be happier. They will come in earlier, and they will get a lot more stuff done. That is suspending a person comfortably and productively. It doesn't have to be chair. It doesn't have to be the linear thing that we think of doing. So, when we see people struggling with smart, right, smart technology, smart manufacturing, we really see three big topics that, that themes uh, that limit them. Technology dispersion, right? We're showcasing an innovation. We're piloting a thing and announcing it publicly and we're getting a lot of sizzle and a lot of press. But, there's not a whole lot of outcomes that are talked about. There aren't a whole lot of outcomes that were talked about before they launched, right? It was technology for the sake of technology. It was sizzle for the sake of sizzle. It was innovation and experimentation for the sake of innovation and experimentation as opposed to for the sake of an outcome that we need to solve a business problem that we have. That simple step, that strategic step is critical. Often we think of things like smart technology as IT. Right? That's our technology folks that come up with that. Smart technology is foundationally and fundamentally business strategy and operations. IT is a necessary and critical partner to that. That is not the, the purpose, the reason, the goal of smart technology. It is business strategy and operations. You will improve your operations alignments at minimum. Your operations alignment to business strategy by deploying smart technologies. And if you're doing a smart technology and you have to talk yourself into how it's improving that, it's the wrong technology. Shut that innovation down. Move on to another one that has a hard tie to a business problem. I'm gonna skip the second one for a second. Unclear economics, right? A lot of times when we're working with clients that are in this space, we ask to see the business case for what they're doing, right? There's gotta be a return on investment. That's what we do is business, as, is return on investment, and we don't have one. Or we have one that was clearly done on the back of a napkin that someone transferred to an Excel spreadsheet. It's not even math, it's barely arithmetic. That's not a business case. You need to have first order impact. First order impacts, not second order, not squishy things. First order hard economic impacts and if they're not there, trust me, you will find them with another innovation. Move on from the one that doesn't have it and then the big one, the skill gap. 
right? The main issue is a low digit issues are uh, low digital IQ organizationally, a lack of skilled professionals, and improper skill set design. Right, so there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal last week. The US military, the most rigidly defined job structures on Earth, the US military, the Navy within the military, has moved over the last 10 years to a model of generous generalists versus specialists. They are now running battleships with 40 people staffing them, and it used to be 400 minimum because they want folks to be more fungible. They had redundancy. They were making it more expensive to do the tasks that they needed to do. We're doing the same thing with our people. We have people who are understandably, as digital toys come into the workplace, defensive. You're trying to take my job. And then we lie to them. And we say, no, we're not. The answer is, I am trying to take your job, but I'm not trying to take you. I still need you. You are more than your job, you are more than your description. What you know about this company, about this industry, about the culture, and about our customers, I cannot replace with technology. There are other things that I can and will move you to. But if we're not clear on one, what those other things are, and two, how we'll do it, they will understandably, justifiably, and correctly not believe you. We still need those people. That doesn't change. We don't necessarily need them doing the job they're doing now. And we can help them make the transition. We can help them as business entities. And when we tie in with community commitment from academic institutions, from community organizations and institutions, we can fundamentally change the future workforce, but the existing workforce and pull them into the future. That, if you had to fix one thing, if you're serious about smart and going digital, that would be the one place I would tell you to start. There's a lot of places you can that are legit, right? You may have a better reason to start somewhere else. Start there. It will become your blocker at some point. Let's knock it out of the way on the front end. Also, when you incorporate your people into this and you knock down their fear of you're trying to replace me, right, versus you're trying to replace my job, you tap into a wealth of creativity around how to innovate the way you do things that you cannot get from anyone else. So, we're going to shift gears. We're going to go to the panel, because you're, you're understandably tired of me by now. I can see it in your faces. You don't have anything to look at but me, but remember, I have nothing to look at but you. So, uh, <laughs> we actually know how this is working. So, we're going to introduce our panels. I'm going to hang out over here and get ready for that, and, uh, and we'll bring folks up. Let's welcome our panelists. Dr. Shakar Shadra Shakar, he's a smart manufacturing lead at the California Manufacturing Technology Consultant. Come on up. Dana Morgan, Director of Market Strategy for Dacri. And Dr. Finwin Prager, Professor of College of Business at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Take it away. All right, so I'm still hanging out using this one. Okay, all right. So here's how we're going to do this. Um, first thing is we're just going to sort of go down the line and let folks introduce themselves and tell you a little something-something about what they do. And uh, then we're going to ask them some questions. I'm going to ask them some questions. And then the part we can't script, you get to ask questions. Uh, and I am offering a prize of exactly nothing but my admiration for the person who asks the hardest question. Uh, so please file that away. I'm sure there will be a, a, a swift and, and heated competition for that award. Um, so let's start with you, Shek. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. First of all, I want to thank you for spending the time to come here and inviting me to this panel. It's a real pleasure and honor to be speaking in front of so many educated and informed and people who probably know a lot more than I am. That said, I work for an organization called CMTC. How many of you have heard of CMTC? Just a quick show of hands. OK, not too many, so let me just spend a few seconds there. CMTC is a 501c3 corporation located here in Torrance, California. We are part of a national network called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. And what this network enables us to do is to collect the knowledge across the nation and then bring that, bring that down to the state of California so that we can help the state grow its and do some public good. 
To that end, we have also built a California manufacturing network to help the small and mid-sized manufacturers. Our mission in life is to help small and medium-sized manufacturers. Believe it or not, in the state of California, there are 39,000 small and mid-sized manufacturers. So if we can help them move their needle in terms of their growth and profitability, we will have done a lot of public good. And that is really our focus. And we cannot do that alone. That said, the face of manufacturing has changed over the many years. I have had the opportunity to work for manufacturing in the early 90s, technology companies in the early 90s, and have seen that change. And when I see that change, it all goes back to three major dimensions. One is the what. What really addresses the technological changes that have taken place over the many years? The who, the people, who are front and center in any organization. And when I engage with anybody to Rick's point, they are the real asset in terms of what that company is. They define the identity of the organization. And then where is the location? Because I think the public good and the economic welfare to that community is driven by bringing these three factors together. And what we would like to do in CMTC is to work with people like you, work with the organizations, co-create this roadmap because this is a journey. This is not an event. This is where we strike at the identity of the organization, help them evolve, help them get to the end state, and minimize what Rick in his slide said, that loop of iterations so that we can get to that desired end state as quickly as possible. That's who we are, and that's who I am. Thank you. Great, great. One, wonderful. Um, so, well, first, can I just say, can we give Rick a, another round of applause for that phenomenal talk? Because I haven't heard someone so succinctly say everything that's been going through my mind uh, for the last five years. Uh, and I just, I really enjoyed that. Um, so I'm Dana Morgan. I work at a company called Daiquiri. We are an augmented reality software and hardware uh, platform company. Um, we'll refer back to uh, Rick's previous question about, do you know the difference between AR and VR? Uh, and so very quickly, I'll just summarize that for you in case you're unclear. So um, who here's heard of virtual reality? Me too. Um, I love it. Uh, virtual reality, you put on a headset or you put up your phone, something to your face, and you feel like you're completely immersed, right? You're seeing digital content everywhere you look. You look down, you don't see your hands, but you see all sorts of other cool things, right? So augmented reality is gonna kind of invert that. So rather than you're, you going into a digital world, the digital content is coming into your physical world. How many of you have seen Iron Man or Minority Report or anything where there's computers floating in the sky or asking Jarvis to do something for you? Uh, we're not quite there yet, but the concept of bringing digital content into your physical space when you need it, where you need it, but still seeing the world around you, seeing the machinery you might be working on, that's what augmented reality is. So, um, so Daiquiri is focusing specifically on industrial use cases of that and um, working with companies to help change how they uh, manufacture, how they otherwise do business, and also augmenting that workforce and the people to support them in that transition to different roles, um, different skills, and maybe just support how they're already doing what they're doing. Uh, and I work with the product team, the customers, to help figure out how do you take it from that early innovation uh, lab stage to an, a way to deploy it? How do you get to that transform and where do you start? So that's what uh, I'm working on. Thank you, it's great to be here. It's really exciting actually to be away from the classroom and engaging with people really on the front line of these issues. You know, we, we teach these things, we, we think about these things, we research these things, but to meet the people that are struggling with solving the real problems that we're talking about in the classroom is fantastic. Um, my name is Finn Prager, and alongside being a faculty member, which is the predominant role that I have, um, a colleague and I, uh, Dr. Jose Martinez, run the South Bay Economics Institute. Um, we've been going for just over three years. We've brought in over 300,000 in grant funding, so 
it's been really exciting and fun to have that opportunity. Um, one of the things we do alongside Marilyn McPellan, who's sat over here, is to um, help organize the South Bay Economic Forecast, which we invite you to all come to. It's a fantastic event in, um, is it October? In late October. Um, similar to this, but with also um, lots more industry representation. Um, another thing that I'd like to pitch is that we're, as an institute, are looking for advisory board members. So if you're interested in helping us grow and develop into the next stage in our, um, in our development, then we'd really like to have you involved. Um, yeah, I'll pass okay. it back over to Rick. So we're going to start out a little general, and then we're going to get more specific with each of you. And so at a general level, and uh, since, we, since we, 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 we started out with Shaker, we're going we're gonna to reverse it. We're going to start out with Finn on this one. Um, when you think about smart manufacturing, smart technologies in the manufacturing space, what's the value proposition for it? Why should manufacturers even be thinking about it or exploring it? So for me, I do some economic research, and the thing that just springs to mind immediately is to improve productivity. And so when we model these kind of questions, we think about you know, how can that productivity improvement help the individual company? But then there's also much broader impacts. So if a company can implement any of those many elements of smart manufacturing, whether it's AR, VR, blockchain, um, big data, supply chain um, management tools, all of those elements can help to improve productivity. Hopefully, you're also improving the individual worker human capital in the process. Um, and those benefits are not just for the company, but also spread throughout the supply chain. And so the dream world that we see in the future is one where not just individual companies are product, more productive, but also all of their partners in the supply chain. And that helps our regional economy. It helps our workers improve. It brings many benefits and prosperity to us all. Great. Dana, same question to you. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo a lot of the same sentiments. I think, as we've heard already today, it's it's about what we make and, and how we make it. And so if we're already making something we, we believe in, uh, we believe it's adding value to society, to progress, uh, then it's only natural that we want to be as, as efficient uh, and ideally as intelligent as we can be in, in the process of doing that. So there's, there's a you know, no-brainer there. And at the end of the day, business is business. And usually there's a, there's a money element too, right? So if we're talking very practically, we want to optimize uh, the tools that we have at our disposal. And as innovation and technology um, kind of continue to evolve and bring more tools at our disposal, uh, we need to figure out how to intelligently adopt those and how to bring them into the workforce. Okay. Check it. For people who know me, if I were to answer these questions, I'll be standing up pacing with a big whiteboard, writing sketches and explaining. <laughs> I'll try to be dignified today. That said, <laughs> I ask myself this question, what's the value of taking action? And I want to kind of echo what Finn just said. It's about productivity and it's about improved competitiveness. Let's take three examples. And I look at General Mills as a large corporation that has implemented SMART. And what it has done is it's from the farm to the fork and has realized over $20 million of ingredient savings year over year. You might turn around and say, well, it's a large company. They have resources. They can do it. Great. Let's look at another company. It's a small woodworking company in Ohio. They came into being in 2001. They implemented SMART and grew tenfold over a period of 10 years. Well, you can turn around and say, OK, great. Now you have a small company. You have a large company. Is it a medium-sized company? Yep, there is an industrial goods company that implemented SMART and reduced their claims by 90% and improved their um, delivery times by 20%. So the answer is, the value of taking action is applicable throughout the continuum from small to large. But it goes back to one fundamental issue, which is we need to change culture, and it's all about strategy. But in order to do that, what is the one fundamental thing that enables this change? And that is data and information. So there are five things people need to consider when you consider the value of taking action. And all goes back to data. 
and that is the right information at the right time, in the right form, with the right technology, in the hands of the right people. If I have these five things, we can make smarter decisions. And if I make smarter decisions, I will be successful. Let me give you an example. If I take a doctor in an operating room and I'm performing a heart surgery, and we have Edwards Life Sciences here who make artificial valves, so I happen to see some of that. So one of the key things they do is they, they observe the blood pressure. If I don't know that information at the right time, I cannot do my surgery. Just imagine if somebody writes it on a napkin and gives it to the doctor. The doctor's not gonna look at it. It has to be in the right form. It has to be in the right technology because you have all these devices in the operating room. And that information better go to the doctor on time. Otherwise, that patient dies. Just take the same scenario and move it to a manufacturing floor where you have a whole bunch of machines and instead of the biomarkers, you have machine markers. So ultimately, when I think of why, I think of leveraging the tools and Rick pointed to the iPhones because the majority of people in the factory have iPhones or iPads and stuff like that. To leverage that power of technology, leveraging making use of these five things and making the right decisions. But ultimately, the result of all of these things and going back to the why, is it helps create this 360 degree view of the client. Because it's all about the customer and the customer experience because without the customer experience, you don't have a why. And it's a holistic approach to align supply and demand because otherwise you'll be producing more than what you need. And that's the power, in my opinion, of SMART. Fantastic. Thank you. So the, and to make it, give you a tangible, small example, but a tangible one, that I think ties in unleashing the power of your people with the benefits that you can get from going smart. So one of the big auto manufacturers, uh, who shall remain nameless, um, they are a highly automated manufacturing process, and at the core of any manufacturing process is logging in, right? Making sure you know who's doing what where right, and has access and permissions and controls to use the machine or access a particular room. They, given the size of their workforce, over a thousand times a day, globally, were having to have employees on a chat line resetting their password because they forgot their password, right? Simple, simple act disappears. Like, we don't really track that at a line item. It just disappears. Three years ago, a kid, you know what, she's not a kid. She is a formidable and remarkable young woman. I'm just really, really old. Um, this formidable and remarkable young woman who worked on the assembly line um, at a plant of theirs in uh, Latin America wrote a bot that would automate the resetting of a password so that even if it took a thousand, you know, over a thousand a day, which roughly took three minutes on average of a rep's time, and an employee's time, so six total person minutes, to resolve, wrote a bot so it could be done on average in three seconds. That bot went nowhere for two and a half years because nobody paid attention to it. Six months ago, they instituted it, and they've pulled tens of millions of dollars globally. Multi, multi, multi-billion dollar company. This isn't like a huge amount to them, but all it took was one motivated kid to, write a, to see a problem and use the skills that she had that weren't applicable in her everyday job to pull tens of tens of millions of dollars a year out that they could deploy to a higher and better use. And it implied two things. One, listen to your folks, but two, arm them with the tools and the process that allows you to take advantage of that, because that was an accident. Imagine what they could do if they started doing that on purpose. Imagine how much better their bottom line would be or how much more productively they could deploy capital if they just turn that person loose. That's an extraordinary, small, little bitty example of the power of doing something like this. So smart's cool, smart's valuable, smart's good. Dana, I wanted to turn to you with, given how accessible it is generally, and then the things that Daiquiri has done to really make it kind of easy and not intimidating to venture into this world, what do you think the biggest blockers are? Like, what's getting in our way from folks uh, adopting it? I, I wish I knew. Um, I think, so just as a sidebar to 
not make it a sales pitch by any means, but to talk a little bit about what Rick was alluding to, what we are doing that might be different in the space. So a lot of times if you've heard about augmented reality, um, it's probably in the context of uh, something that developers should be looking at and maybe something they can dabble with and there's some sort of developer kit and offering and things that aren't necessarily out of the box value. And so over the last couple of years, Daiquiri tried to change that because we were hearing that from our customers as well. So now we have um, an offering that ships with our wearable device, uh, a software suite of tools, and the goal is to give you as much immediate value when you turn your device on as, as humanly possible. So um, kind of think of it like the Microsoft Office of, of AR. What can I do and turn on and use? Um, and it, it partially answers Rick's question, which was why over the years have we been hearing so much about something like AR, but not necessarily seeing it move past an innovation lab or you know a kind of dabbling pilot project? And I think there's a few things. There's there's cost, right? Where you go, okay, uh, it sounds kind of scary and expensive, and I don't know where I'm going to get my budget from. Uh, so then maybe you create an innovation lab, and you go go forth and and explore and look into this for me. Um, and, and often, in the last few years, I've said, well, that's where technology has gone to die. And I don't mean that to be rude. I think innovation labs do a lot of really important, um, you know, blocking and, and, and exploring and help, you know, spearhead it into the organization. But if your organization has given the innovation money into the innovation lab and not the operations budget, then it's not actually going to get into your workers' hands or change how you're doing anything because you haven't set up your organization to actually adopt a new process. It's been set up to be in another place behind another door on someone else's desk. Uh, when really now what we're seeing in the last 18 months is a, a bit of more of a curve into businesses understanding that if I want to get to a deployable use case that my employees can use, I need to put it on the factory floor where they're going to use it. It needs to get out of the office and into their hands. And the only way I can make that happen is by giving the people who are responsible for business operations the budget to actually bring innovation and new projects into their day to day. Uh, and I think, again, that's been something that's been quite separate over the last few years and is, is slowly starting to kind of converge and hopefully will lead to a little bit more broader adoption. Outstanding. Then, um, Finn, I'm going to come to you, you next, and then Shaker, you're going to you're going to bring us home. Um, so, 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 Finn, when you think about, because I know you think about the workforce, right? And 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 how do we prepare them? What do you see as some of the greatest needs in terms of preparing a workforce? Whether those are structural, whether those are topical, where do you see the 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 opportunity for us to serve the community? Sure, I'd, I'd like to first just draw upon the example that you just gave of what the buzzword at the moment is called intrapreneurship, not just entrepreneurship. So one thing that we've been talking a lot about in, at Dominguez Hills, and we've got both an innovation incubator and an entrepreneurship um, institute, and they're really pushing for students who both want to set up their own companies and have that idea and want to build something, but also those who want to problem solve within organizations. So that entrepreneurial spirit and culture that we're fostering across campus is important within companies as well to solve those key problems. And I think that's something that um, I see every day on campus amongst our faculty, amongst our admin, amongst our students, and something that I really want to, um, you know, I'm glad that we're fostering that. Well, and we're seeing with, um with ourselves, PwC has gone down that route over the last five years and with an awful lot of our clients where we see that uh, culture and that opportunity existing in earnest, right? As opposed to just sort of a, eh, there's an institute, there's three people in it and they're not really fully here, right? But when it's really part of the culture, um, we saw on just on our part with our employees who were tenured less than four years, which correlated with younger employees, our retention rate went up dramatically very quickly. Um, and so there's measurable benefit there in terms of retention and not having to incur the recruiting and replacement costs. Anyway. And specifically in terms of smart manufacturing and that kind of broad umbrella, I, I think that 
what we're going to see is the need for, you know, and there's many reports on this, and CMTC do a fantastic job of highlighting the workforce needs and, you know, the buzzwords being tech-savvy workforce and, you know, it's that blend of the traditional manufacturing worker with the um, skills that, to both understand the general topics but also be able to maybe code a bit, be, be able to solve problems in terms of the robotics that they're going to be using, be able to implement new technologies, whether it's blockchain or other supply chain management systems. And, and actually, I think that's really exciting because it, it, you know, it's not just about pulling levers anymore. As my, um, I've got a good family friend, you know, he spent his whole life just pulling that same lever every day, and I'm sure it got utterly tedious at points. Now, I think it's a much more exciting and engaging place to work um, that we're going to see in the future. And so I think that's, um, that's exciting, it's stimulating, and it also requires a different level of education, workforce preparation. You're going to see a lot more business students come into this field. You're going to see a lot more IT students. Uh, you know, it's going to be a changing um, workforce. So I think that's a, a positive for the worker and for the companies. All right, fantastic. And then, Shigar, you've, you, you've, you've, um, you've hit on some of these things, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to go a little bit more in depth. When we think about, you know, what are some of the approaches, what are some of the steps, specific steps that a manufacturer can take to start to move down this pathway? What guidance, what advice would you have as folks are getting ready to move in that direction? So in terms of digital transformation, when you read the books and you look at what people have done, you can kind of group them into two different clusters. One is what I'm going to call the, the linear transformation, or some people use the word sustaining innovation, where you kind of create these building blocks and you evolve and transform your business. Then there is the Peter Diamond and the singular universities of the world who call it exponential transformation, where they strongly believe that technologies will change the way you completely think. Let's give an example. Additive versus subtractive. It's a totally different way of thinking. The question then becomes, is this technology applicable across the board? What do I need to do? And I, when I work with clients and I work with people, large, small, medium, it doesn't matter over my years, the first and most important thing I say is, imagine your business as a three block model. At the foundation is the identity of your business. And that has to be determined before you take the next step about process and then about outcomes. Because we can work on process improvement all we want, but if the identity of the organization does not embrace that change, it's not happening. And your outcomes are not going to be delivered the way you had planned. So in all of these changes and all of these transformations, whether you take a linear approach, whether you take an exponential approach, you start with the identity of the organization. Bring in the notion of a team. Bring in the notion of multifunctional. Bring in the notion that people look at the same problem differently. Create that, what I'm going to call that digital environment where people think differently. And to go back to this example that Rick pointed out about an, a, a phone, right? My mom, who's 88, has an iPad. And I switched her from an iPad 2 to an iPad 3. There was no fundamental difference. But as soon as she saw the iPad 3, she said, I don't know how to use it. It looks different. All it was was that the screen size was slightly smaller. So I use that as an extreme example. But when we start to think about companies which have to change, I think we need to start with that education, that, that kind of bringing together the shared vision of where they want to go and make them part of the solution. And so when we work with companies on this digital transformation or this digital journey, we actually engage the people in developing the solution right up front from a, both a strategic level and from a tactical level. What works? What doesn't work? Why does it work? Why does it not work? What is your goal? How do you want to accomplish your goal? So we start with the culture. We build the strategy on top of the culture. And then we ask them the readiness for change. The readiness for change has multiple dimensions. And one of the big factors that I've always seen is, hey, is it going to cost me a million dollars to make this change? 
how, what is the smallest change I can make so that I can see the impact and then start to build blocks. Now, I don't come up with a solution because I don't know the solution. So I work with them. Okay. And then we, and after a couple of facilitated sessions, the light bulb goes on and says, wow, here is where we start. So the answer to your question here is start with the culture, build a strategy, co-create the solution, lay out the roadmap so people are engaged in every step. And every implementation, let's make it real. Let's Let's measure the ROI. This is not about fluff. This is about them realizing the value. It's about them, the small and mid-sized manufacturers in our case, being productive and being competitive. Hope that addresses. That's fantastic. So um, before we turn it over to questions, um, I can't tell if I'm on right now or not. Oh. Rick, can you grab the microphone next to you? I can. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, I felt so Bono, you know, <laughs> and, and now I'm just like a dude, like I, I, like I don't even, like I got a cord, you know, like I'm, I'm totally analog right now. I just, I but you're like secure though. I, I just feel like this is my car. Yes, good point. But this is my karmic debt coming back. Um, <laughs> so a few parting thoughts before we open it to, to, to questions. One is, um, as we've talked about, right. you've got a tremendous ass asset in your workforce. There are things you can do to unleash that asset in a way that will yield results that I don't think um, that that we, PwC, when we went down this path ourselves and our clients in this space, really, all of our business cases were too low. The value far exceeded that which we predicted, and it was predicting a lot. Um, two, I always kind of like to like tease something like this with, here's two topics that I think are going to be hot topics a year from now at an event like this. One that we mentioned, one that we did not. The one that we mentioned, we just mentioned it, is blockchain. Extraordinary implications across manufacturing. The other one is digital twinning. Um, so just a quick show of hands, digital twin, have you heard the term? Right? It's a year from now, everyone's hand will go up. Um, at a high level, it is creating a data virtual replica of your entire manufacturing process and your entire value chain. It allows you to see, to automate, to do quality control in a fashion that you've never been able to do it before. Um, the technologies are nascent. There are some providers that are extraordinarily good at it. I'm not talking about folks like me, consultants. We'll, we'll tell you we're good at everything. Um, and, you know, I say that glibly. I'm also arrogant, and I think we are. But, um, there are vendors, there are leading technology vendors, and I don't want to turn it into an infomercial, that uh, have invested significantly in specifically that. Um, and I think it's going to really, really open up some avenues for folks in manufacturing that have been um, unavailable to us in the past. And so now I think we'd like to turn it over to, to questions. Fire away with anything you got. Okay, we got a microphone coming to you. Okay, ask for a hard one. Yeah, yeah um, for one of them. <laughs> it, it can be any of the four of you. So, first of all, I grew up in Detroit. Um, the auto industry, my father was a line foreman. Um, most of my family was in the unions. I work with tech companies in augmented reality, in um, you know automated warehouse tech, and so on but live and work in San Pedro that right now is going through a huge existential crisis of the future of automation at the ports. You want to talk about workforce issues? What would you say to the unions? How would you help find a UK use case to make that transition? Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, l l let me take a step. I'll be way off, but that's okay. It's a place to iterate. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry. I go back to the days of Pony Express just as an example. Pony Express, I forget the exact number they employed. They employed a lot of people. But one fine day, they were all unemployed. Because it was not about the people. It was the fact that Pony Express disappeared and you had the telegraph system. 
If we truly believe that people are the assets of an organization, which I strongly believe, because they have that knowledge base, they have the thinking capability, they have the capability to solve problems. I think if we can anticipate some of these changes, especially these days with technology, with, with, with content, and with communications, we can create a roadmap for I'll call worker training or people training or people awareness. See how these shifts are going to make the workforce of the future different and invest in the people because without that investment, nothing is gonna happen. And this investment, in my opinion, has to come from multiple directions. It has to, there has to be a corporate investment, there has to be a public investment, there has to be a people investment, and all of them working together with consulting companies and others, at least one can develop a map that can be socialized and say, does it even make sense? It is, again, coming back, it has to be co-created. It cannot be created by one person and pushed down and said, hey, here is the silver bullet, let's solve it. That's just my opinion. It's in generality, but then you can take a use case and start to build. So we have, um, we've worked with a handful of companies where the demographic you described resonates with me on, on some of our customer bases. Um, so what I've seen in those situations is, is a couple things. Number one, uh, to kind of echo some of the themes we already heard from, from Rick's talk earlier, uh, we're talking about changing how people are, are working, but not changing who's doing the work. We're not trying to overhaul a, a workforce and, and rehire it. And in fact, usually the issue our customers also have is that um, they're seeing a dropping off of new people joining that particular workforce uh, in lieu of other industries or other professions or maybe uh, science degrees instead of the humanities, whatever it might be. So there's actually a real need in staying very relevant and attracting uh, new generations into that workforce as well. So there has been a lot of um, really interesting and sometimes surprising uh, support from, from veteran workers who might have otherwise originally been a little bit nervous of a change or uh, felt a little bit threatened, realizing that it's a huge tool for them to use their expert knowledge that, as again, Rick mentioned, we need to help bring a new workforce into the industry that they happen to be working in and also help keep them there, uh, help them feel excited uh, to do the job to continue to innovate in that job and to feel like they're adding value uh, to something that is is exciting and and new and enticing. And then the second thing is trying to make sure that obviously we have to start from the ground up. We can't we can't innovate with a big vision, a big picture at a leadership level and expect it all just to magically happen down on the ground. You have to do bottom up and you have to start with what's the one thing I can do to make your, your job easier today? Uh, and it's not going to be the, the science fiction future of the movies I referenced earlier. We're not jumping uh, a decade later. We're saying, how do you, how do you make a phone call right now? Uh, can I give you a, a, a device that might let you do your job at the same time and be hands-free and communicate with your peer uh, across town or across the world? Uh, do you want to add some annotations or have a little bit of content that you don't need to know is AR? It's just going to help what you're doing. Why don't we start there? And once you feel like that's valuable, I can show you what else this thing can do. You know, But we, we don't try to jump to the end state because... It's, it's scary sometimes. Um, and also, quite frankly, the, no one is there yet. I'm not there yet. The technology isn't there yet. The end state is, is a vision and an aspiration, but it's also malleable and completely collaborative and will not be purchased unless the customers that I'm working with, the workers who need to use it, are informing us. And uh, quite frankly, if we don't sell something, we don't exist. So uh, it's a product market fit, just like any other industry. But, um, but again, you, you have to start small. And that's where we always recommend beginning. You don't have to worry about, uh, about you know, Iron Man yet. I think it's an excellent question. And 
one of the things that struck me about the the port um, having you know our our university has a memorandum of understand of understanding with the port of LA, and we've done some work with them. And what has always struck me is the impressive collaborative effort between all of the players. So unions are at the table, and the ports are at the table, and the um, the companies are at the table, the the, the freight haulers are at the table. So that's the best place to start. I can't speak about the tensions and the conflicts that I'm sure exist. But from our point of view as educators and interested in workforce development, the what one thing has struck me about this field is just the amount of opportunities that there are available and the amount of resources that this community has. So whether it's the LADC who do fantastic analyses trying to match where the demand for labor is compared to where what the supply is that's coming from community colleges. I know that they've just finished a study on that. Or the CSU system. Um, there's a huge amount of work going on in the CSU five, which are the five universities, uh, Cal State universities in this region, that as our provost like to um, highlight, if they were to band together more, they would be scary to USC and to UCLA because it is a huge system. You know, you're talking roughly a fifth of the largest system in the US in terms of graduates. And they're doing amazing things. It's, there's too many to go into, but in engineering schools, in, um, in our business school, we've got great programs that are teaching about you know, applied case studies on smart manufacturing, on the use of, inter, um, of smart technology in the manufacturing workplace. So I think there's, there's always got to be this kind of push and pull between the reality of the marketplace and then what we can do is on the education and workforce training side. Another great partner that we have is the South Bay Workforce Investment Board. They actually just won a $12 million grant and the only one in the state to um, provide training and apprentices, um, apprenticeship sorry, in um, smart manufacturing, in um, advanced manufacturing. And they also have great programs in the biotech sector. So, Please, if you're interested in seeing conflicts there, reach out to these organizations because as one local entrepreneur put it, the resources available are like drinking from a fire hydrant in this region. There's just that much there. Often it's finding it, finding who to connect with is the real problem. Great, we have another question. The question is, the question is very similar to the one which was asked earlier. Uh, which industries uh, and occupations do you think Obsolete in the next three to five years. The counterpart, if I want to give advice to my teenage boys as to what are the future jobs, the jobs will be in very high demand in the next three to five years. So, as far as what will become obsolete in the next three to five years, I've been wrong on every guess I've ever made on that, so <laughs> not, not even venturing down that. Um, uh, I see a uh, few skills that are, or a few areas of learning that are, will be extraordinarily important. Can't hear him. Math. Um, and um, uh, humanities and the combination of the two. We have an awful lot of engineers and business people that don't understand humans. We have a lot, an awful lot of humanities majors who understand the bejesus out of humans but can't do basic arithmetic. Um, we need both skills, and right now, to find both skills, businesses have to hire two different humans. Um, and it is a leftover construct of specialization with an education that is keeping those as two separate humans. You can create a hellaciously good program that combines the two. Hi, thank you very much for um, all your insights. My name is Bonnie Nixon. I teach sustainable supply chain at UCLA. And, um, and I've worked at companies like Hewlett Packard and Walmart and Mattel and, and on complex issues like um, conflict minerals in the Congo and trying to trace it. Um, we've mentioned the word blockchain a few times. I would love for the panel to, number one, quickly demystify what we mean by that. And number two, talk about since I believe it's somewhat of a linear process, and if that's wrong, correct me, um, how do we deal with this complex, interdependent net of corrupt and far-reaching supply chains 
um, with blockchain or some permutation of it? Uh, I can say this one because we just wrote a, um, a report looking at blockchain and its potential impacts on the South Bay economy here. Um, to give a brief example, there are companies who are, uh, and, and social entrepreneurship um, operations who are looking into exactly that issue of how do you use blockchain, which is, for those that aren't aware, um, a, uh, basically a way of um, transforming the transactional accounting system that we use um, in supply chains, but also in any contracting um, uh, framework. So instead of there just being one piece of paper or one record or one file on one computer, the, um, the core file is replicated across a whole network of computers so that it's um, not as easily corrupted, it's not going to be um, hacked as easily, there's um, much stronger cybersecurity around that. It also enables um, a much clearer traceable um, uh, accounting of any information that could be stored within that file, which is now across multiple um, nodes of that network. The potential uses of it are many and, and varied. And, and one interesting thing is the amount that it's being used in these various different social entrepreneurship um, uh, uses. So you're seeing you know, there's many challenges in terms of charitable giving, making sure that the money that we're donating in any given place in the world is actually reaching the person or the people or the group that we want it to reach. And so that there's interest, really interesting innovations that are going on. Um, I've read about a number in Africa that are trying to make sure, for example, that the Niger Delta cleanup is actually being monitored and um, implemented in the way that we hope it is being, if you're, you're giving money to that. And the same could be clearly um, implemented for conflict diamonds or any um, you know, counterfeit products maybe that are in the, uh, in the uh, global supply chains, which currently are really difficult to trace. Um, I did, we did a project a few years back with Customs and Border Protection, and they were telling us that illegitimate products are ending up in Target stores because the the products are so similar, or even made by the same factories as the legitimate products, that they can make it through into the gray and then into the kind of white market, if you will, the legitimate market from that um, illegitimate market. And functions like blockchain can solve that problem. The problem with blockchain is that it's very clunky technology right now. It's still being rolled out in many instances, and much in the same way as many of these other smart technology um, innovations are going to take time to implement because they need to be worked into legacy systems. It's going to be an, a while yet before we see them applied across the full array of areas that we would expect them to. Rick, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, it, just, uh, just a last note on blockchain quickly. I'm not a blockchain guy. Here's something that's telling. When you look at the big four accounting firms, and PwC is one of those, those firms are very smart about looking at something, determining whether or not it's a threat to its existence, and if it is, not running away from it, but investing in it. Uh, there's a really interesting question around what do you need an auditor for if blockchain really is ubiquitously applied? PwC and our competitors are investing heavily in blockchain. That's what got my attention about blockchain more than anything. Sorry, so one more, one more question. Hi, my name is John. I work for the city. I'm actually a regulatory enforcer. And I had a question about how uh, I would need to go talk to uh, the businesses uh, that I actually regulate, small businesses, stuff like that. And so I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, but in a global, uh, bigger picture, how would we as a government enforcement uh, regulatory uh, entity have to change in order to go adapt to what's going on with you guys. And this may tie back with your question around the, the community that's going through tremendous change. The, I talked earlier about how our operating models for businesses are almost certainly wrong, or at least out of alignment, because they were not designed for digital. I think you can apply the same thing to regulatory bodies. The operating model can't be correct. It wasn't designed to regulate this domain. 
right, and some of the tools and toys that are available. It doesn't mean it's 100% wrong. It just can't be 100% right anymore. And in an awful lot of labor conflicts that I've seen over the last five years, and I'm not an expert in them by any stretch of the imagination, I often see a business that desperately needs to innovate its operating model talking to a union that needs to innovate its as well, because for the same reason. And it's not a situation where I think anyone is being intractable or wrong. I think they're just not saying it. And sometimes some of the conflict we see is based on process clash that is fomented by operating models that are out of date and forced to clash. Um, there's plenty of clashing going on over real things, over, over legitimate issues that need to be resolved. But I think we are introducing noise into the system, be system because we have an operating model. Um, outdated operating model disagreement in an age where it doesn't apply. But everyone on this panel is way smarter than I am, so I'm going to let them answer it. My take on it, and again, I go back to building on this operating model, is if we are truly in a digital economy and the data forms the center of what we try to do, in an incremental growth process, we can start to at least build in a data-driven culture so that they're aware of what the regulatory and compliance requirements are as part of today's operating model. See how they can meet some of those requirements and then go from there and transform their business. So that's, to me, the simplest answer that I can think of right now. There's definitely the potential for to use new technology like black blockchain in the regulatory process. So there's a number of different trials of blockchain by government for government records, for, um, for um, real estate accounts and things like this. And, and I, I see a huge potential for regulatory agencies to tap into these new technologies and use them to their own advantage. Um, but I teach in public administration, so I'll bore everyone silly if I go into all the details. <laughs> um, I'm going to not entirely answer your question, but for the sake of talking again, no. Um, I, I think, um, again, because our, my purview is, is, is quite focused on, on augmented reality, of course, uh, I'll, I'll give you this angle, which is if you're thinking about how a business is transforming and the operational changes that have to happen there, um, there are steps along the way that are, are you, are you changing how you're operating out the gate or are you changing um, the medium in which you're doing maybe the same step in that operation process? So there is a, a middle road that AR actually is is quite present in right now. We're kind of playing in that space of change management within an organization where you say, okay, I already have a process. Um, right now it's paper. Let's help get that hands-free and digital. And we go, okay, that's great. And so it's a, a step toward um, this evolution. But then, of course, the, the long term game is a, is a more evolved operational workflow that ideally will rely on data and potentially more artificial intelligence to make better predictions and help have more data to, to understand and, and you know audit. But there's also that compliance element there too, where if you know what's happening for training up front, if you know what's happening for um, you know quality assurance up front, if you if you can kind of have visibility into that as the processes mature, um, it's easier on the other side to then audit some of those processes. And I think yeah, I we're uh, I think we have filibustered. Uh, effectively and long enough, um, and and thank you to the LADC, to the panelists up here. Well, really, and to you, you, Rick. I think this conversation has been absolutely fascinating. And to Rick, to Shekhar, to Dana, to Finn, thank you so very much for sharing your morning with us. Um, we're going to finish on time so that if a couple of people who didn't get their questions answered in the full forum want to ask them individually, our guests may have a few minutes that they can spend doing that. Let's also thank our partners in this effort at Cal State Dominguez Hills and PricewaterhouseCoopers for making these events possible. Our very gracious hosts here at Cross Campus El Segundo, I can't imagine a better venue for an intimate conversation like this and such an innovative, forward-looking conversation. We've all been given a lot to think about and act upon. I encourage you all to take away what you learned today and act on it. You and your organizations will be better for it. Thank you for being part of our future forum.